Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. We have a lot of uh, news, reviews, and clues to discuss. But before we get into all of that, I would like to ask everyone to please hit that like, subscribe, notification bell, share with your friends. It really does help support the channel. Brian, what's going on? It's hard to keep up, Pablo. It's hard to keep up right now. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff coming out. Um, and it's been very difficult not to talk about the shows that we're going to talk about today. Um, we're three episodes in, um, and we're four into another one, Invincible. We'll talk about that as well. But first up, Godzilla versus Kong. You saw it. I saw it last night with my son. I this yeah, a. Hey. You can't go wrong with some of these monster movies when it's this. First of all, I have to say, Man of Steel eat your heart out in terms of destructions and not caring about how many people die because <laughs> that was destruction. Thank God for King King Kong must be lucky it wasn't like in a suburb because he wouldn't have been able to dodge none of that. Imagine him trying to juke his way, <laughs> trying to get out of Godzilla's way. He needed those buildings to hang on. Exactly, to. exactly. Uh, but this was a great film in terms of the monster verse situation. Um, the human aspects of it obviously weren't the the highlight of the sh the, the movie. Uh, there were a few moments that were pretty funny. The Brian um, Ty Tyree Henry. Yeah. Where we're pretty cool and funny. Uh, but overall, man, that last sequence with Kong against Mecha Godzilla, again, you heard us last week if you listened to the show about trailers and stuff. It would have been such a great, surprising moment, even though probably initially in the first few scenes, you would have gotten a hint uh, of what was going to happen. But I definitely enjoyed it. I'll give you my rating after I hear what you have to say about this movie, Brian. Yeah, look, I mean, it, it was it was what you came to see. The visuals were amazing. They get better every time they do this. It really did look like there was a giant ape and a giant dinosaur going head to head in a major city. It was yeah, it, was really it felt dope. very physical. Like the physics of it felt very intense and very real. But my biggest positive was Kong. I really thought they gave him a heart and sort of a, a story arc. And he he really was the protagonist of this. Yes, yes, definitely. Almost to a fault. Like he was done so well that it almost came at the expense of Godzilla, who kind of just popped up as sort of this mysterious cause of destruction. Why yeah, is he doing yeah, this? Yeah. We really didn't spend any time with him in this film the way we had in the prior two. And so you know, in some ways, my biggest positive is Kong. My biggest negative is actually Godzilla felt kind of shortchanged. Uh, I didn't really feel like a character. He kind of felt like a prop. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. yeah the, the fights were great, but uh, honestly, like, the human stuff I could do without, they could have cut that in half and given Godzilla more screen time and more more character development, for lack of a better word. And I think it actually would have been more enjoyable, but mm -hmm. um, no, it was, I mean when you get to that final half hour and you kind of realize they're about to go toe to toe and you know sadly you know mecha godzilla is about to stick his nose in the middle of it yeah yeah you just like all right the, the ride's starting and and i felt like the the key shots all kind of delivered and the team up and yeah. you know, how they leveraged the atomic fire with the axe and all that stuff it just you know the payoffs were great so yeah you know for what this is no complaints no idea how they got you know, they paid as many good actors as they did to say the silly <laughs> ones they did for two hours. But, you know, yeah, that's yeah. how these things go. So I thought it was quite enjoyable. And it seems like people really, really enjoyed this, too. That's the really other big storyline. How much did it make um, globally? 200? Three, almost 300 million globally. So we basically got to the to tenant has been the pace setter for global box since COVID hit around mm -hmm, 350 mm -hmm. worldwide. They basically got there in a single weekend, even with a simultaneous streaming release. That is a big, big deal. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, do you think, with, I guess it, it would be safe to say that with the right film, people will go out to the film, to the theaters to go see uh, 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 what they want to see, not a regular film, well-reviewed film, but 
actually like let's say for example i'm just throwing this out there is it possible that disney might change their mind with how they release black widow not to go f- too far off but just just want to see what your your thoughts on that no i actually think it makes them feel better about their strategy because this is proving that there are two types of audiences right now the one that is very happy to sit at home and subscribe and watch and the other that sees the as you said the right kind of movie and this is if you're going to come back to the theater it's not about quality top to bottom it's about event yes and this is the kind of film that the big picture makes 10 times better when i like i saw some of these scenes and said man i wish i wasn't the multiplex right now because the force the audio you said the destruction just to see that yeah yeah imax screen for example would have been incredible so i think that got people out of their homes to say well hey if i'm going to re-engage with theaters this is the kind of movie i want to come back to and the cinema score was was an a which yeah, is yeah. way higher than the other films in the series so people walked out of the theater feeling like hey that was oh, yeah. two hours really well spent what did you think of that whole hollow earth situation? That was like weird for a Kong versus for a Kong film or Godzilla film. That that whole situation was kind of weird for me. So that's that, cool. That it was cool to see, is, but it was weird. So that actually is like a real conspiracy yes, theory yes. that exists. That's, that mm-hmm. actually is not crafted specifically for this story so they leveraged something in the real world and tied it into this mm-hmm. or leveraged it in the real world as in it exists as a theory not that it I meant that it's real but mm-hmm. um like i mean they had to come up with some kind of mission i think for kong right? that effectively was his journey his movement throughout the story and you know, it, it looks cool. I mean, this whole civilization on Man. the ground, it also gives them an excuse. If they wanted to go for sequels, you now have a world below and a world above. And, you know, if you want to kind of have those interact in another way, I mean, it's it's there for you to do. So, Man. you know, it it's one of those where my my sense of reality and belief were suspended long before they ever went into the middle of the earth. So yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. cool, that's fine. <laughs> like, and then I realized that this is where the act was going to be. And this is where his throne is going to be. And I'm like, Oh, great. Okay. That's, yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. where we're going with this. And yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm just sort of my standards and what I'm fine with in movies like this are just different. You know, I yeah, think yeah. back to even the Japanese Godzilla films that they put out, you know, in the sixties and seventies, they're all contrived. They're yeah, all yeah, yeah. completely silly. The aliens, the spaceships, the it's all absurd. Yeah, yeah. And yet, <laughs> as a kid, I found them all fun. So, yeah, you know, yeah, in yeah. some ways, it's, this is just the more modern, yeah, quasi gotcha. serious version of that. Um, what's your rating out of five stars? What would you give it? Five star scale. I would give this, I'd probably give this three and a half. Yeah, I was I was thinking the same thing. Three and a half, three and a half. I would give this movie, and it was a very and like if I would have gone to the theaters to see this movie, I would have came out happy. And these aren't these kind of films where you go and and sort of take a notebook if you're a critic and sort of dissect the film and say, oh, this was bad, this was bad. It's not that type of movie. This is a type of movie that you go to enjoy, um, not necessarily to build a universe around. But certainly to go see it one time, I mean, if they chose to continue, great. But if they didn't, I wouldn't mind it either. But this was a one-time enjoyable film. I would have loved to go see it in the theaters. Who knows? I might. Depends. I don't know. But um, I enjoyed watching it at home on the big screen. And uh, it was a fun. It was fun. I gave it a three and a half as well. Um just wish Godzilla had been in it more. I'm, I think of the two growing up, I was a little partial of Godzilla, and I feel like in King of the Monsters, I thought an underrated part was how much they spent with sort of understanding him and what makes him tick. And I kind of was hoping for a little more continuation of that opposite Kong. And we kind of didn't get that. So that's, that, for me, was worth at least a half star here. It would have been interesting to see it from his perspective as to why he's going out there. 
like like he, like some sort of he senses some sort of thing that's not natural that shouldn't be around and he's going to go I guess to destroy it that was his whole purpose right to yeah. they were building something and I guess the ens- the essence of Ghidorah was still around and was being used and hence why he went to go attack the apex uh um uh I, the the what's it called the establishment that 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 that, that know, Ghidorah was building yeah yeah that. But I just felt like we ended the second one with him in this king role with the other monsters kind of surrounding him. And then we kind of just, they just disappeared entirely from existence for this. And I don't know, it felt like that might have been a loose end that didn't get kind of carried all the way to the end. If you're going to bring Ghidorah all the way to the end, why not bring the whole army? Exactly. I was waiting for Brother Noomsi to show up. Because he was the one that started it off. Because it was Ghidorah, right? He was the one that discovered it. So I was waiting for him to show up. And you bring up a great point. Um, the the other monsters were nowhere to be found. It would have been dope. Like, let's say, halfway through the movie, um, Mecha Godzilla is just, you know, killing takes off the rest of, of the monsters. Huh? Yeah. It yeah, takes so, out a few of them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. And I don't, yeah, that's definitely a plot hole. Uh, good point. Good point. Um, again, let us know what you think in the comment section below uh, of what you thought about uh, Godzilla versus Kong. I thought it was great. I'm pretty sure. I'm going to ask you one question. Uh huh. Since this is your Thundercats director, how do you feel? Do you feel better or more concerned about having this this gentleman, Adam Wingard, at the controls, having seen this film? Again, my concerns. Ha- is having to do with the CGI and animation, but having seen what he did with the Hollow Earth, making it look, you know, someplace we've never been before. Like if if this was Third Earth, if he could make Third Earth look like not Earth and somewhere not on Earth, <laughs> I'm gonna be all for it. You know, is definitely going to be something to look forward to and how it looks. And yeah, my only concern is that. But other than that, I think is going to be very, I'll be more excited when I see. I'm already excited that it's even announced. I thought that would never happen, especially <laughs> after Cats and Wonder Woman 84. But now that it is happening, all I'm waiting is for the trailer so I can go crazy. When the trailer comes out, we, I'm going to give you a live reaction. I'm not going to watch it. I'm going to wait till we do a show and we're going to watch it together. So let, so let us know what you uh, think in the conversation below about Godzilla versus Khan. Did you like it? Let us know. Now let's turn our attention to a show on Amazon that we that when I first saw the trailer for it, I was excited to see. I had never read the comics. Uh, so I was ready to watch this from a, a fresh new eyes and just look at something new. And I'm so glad that they released the first three uh, episodes. I watched all three. It was like on 11 o'clock at night. I watched all three. I couldn't stop watching. And man, it was dope. It was adult as hell, <laughs> but it was dope. It was dope. Uh, let's get into it a little bit. Brian, when you saw, uh, have you seen all four episodes? Yeah, so I'm caught up. I am going to say, I know we usually, let's not spoil yes, the yes, end yes, of yes, episode yes. one. Let's just talk about the idea of it yes. without, for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, it's just, it will take away from your enjoyment too yes, much yes, to, yes, 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 yes. to tell you about it. So we'll just, mm-hmm. we'll refer to it as that scene, but we won't talk about what's in it. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, after that scene, you're like, holy hell, what is going on? And Let's talk first of all. First of all, about some of the characters in the in the, yeah. in the in the show. I think one of my favorite characters is Dark Blood. That's his name, right? Yeah. The demon uh, detective, and him trying to figure it out. Um, first of all, I have to say that the voice acting is fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing. And 
the way they go about sort of uh, figuring out what's happening, who's involved, and the suspecting of certain individuals involved in what happened in that scene is reaching a point where when it is discovered what happened and who is truly behind it is building up to is it gonna it's definitely gonna be the turning point in that show what are your thoughts my other observation generally speaking is i can't quite put my finger on it but the animation is next level good it looks really sharp like even yeah. relative to some of the newer just sleep films or marvel products that are animated like the animation here is really tight like it's really fun like when you sit down and watch it it does kind of stand out on your screen mm. I, I like the setups of the characters i mean i think the way they set up mark is pretty well that that's the son uh, the mm-hmm. main character yeah. uh, I think that's, and I think the way they spend time with the father who is I think we could say like, he's he's the main superhero on the planet at the time he's sort of the older guard superhero at the time yeah. his son is sort of developing his powers like mm-hmm. I thought like, th- those scenes were teased in the trailers and I really liked those scenes those are some of my favorite parts in the in, in the show and it, and it sets up the kind of the twist if you will really kind of you know I don't even know how to describe it. I was trying to think of where that like five minutes ranks for most shocking but well executed piece of comic book adaptation. Because I I didn't I was like you I didn't read the com- these comics and I deliberately went in trying not to look at any material. Yeah. So when that happened. I was just like, my mouth just opened. I was like, what? what? I was, I was, like, <laughs> and then it didn't stop. And I was like, you gotta be kidding. I kept waiting for like the, I kept waiting for the kind of the bait and switch of it. Like, yeah. well, I was like, this has to be fake, right? There's gotta be some nightmare you know, sequence or something. Extra villain or it's a yeah. dream or something's going. And then like, you realize it's not. And you're just like, where is this show headed? yeah yeah um and yeah no the, the the characters are really interesting they do take very classic hero tropes or villain tropes but then they they twist them you know in a way that's really yeah. creative so i think they've i mean if the written comic was this good like congrats i'm surprised this was lying around so long to adapt quite honestly. yeah <laughs> but yeah exactly i also right? couldn't imagine it not being adult i think if you took violence out of it it would not be it wouldn't it work yeah that's it yeah, I like um, pretty much all the characters have their own thing that they're dealing with. Um, and they're all unique. They ha- they bear some similarities to some superheroes that we already know. But I guess the their personalities would differentiate them somewhat. Uh, but all the main players like Cecil, Omni-Man, um, Mark discovering his powers and and yet still trying to be a teenager uh and him learning how to use his powers and, and try to live up to to his pops is uh is is something to watch and it's always it's it's, it's i'm curious not curious but i'm always interested in seeing that father-son relationship developing on 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 tv or screen or whatever uh, and that story developing and how at some point you you go against your father right and and at some point we're probably going to see that uh i hope i didn't give anything away but no that part is fine i think that the part that sort of caught me off guard that i was like why doesn't this happen more in comics is this is the star warsian version of the father-son relationship and it got me thinking like, okay, in comics, we usually see, you know, super powered child, human father, like Clark Kent, Superman, or, you know, human father, human son, like the Starks, for example, right? We rarely see kind of like super powered parent, super powered kid, but then like this crisscrossing of morals between the two, which is effectively sort of the Luke Skywalker, you know, Anakin, Anakin Skywalker slash Darth Vader, 
approach to Star Wars. And so when when I went, when I sort of realized like, oh, that's where we're headed, I was like, yeah, why don't comics do that more often? Because this is actually a pretty good idea. And, yeah, and it yeah. sets up a really compelling, you know, conflict and dilemma for the kid, which is yeah, effectively yeah, yeah. what he's looking at. Yeah. I like how there's so many different uh, plot developments in this with the robot, um, one of the twi twin brutes, obviously with Omni-Man, yeah. uh, Cecil and his plan in, in sort of revealing what happened and who, who's involved or, you know, um, unveiling the truth about it all because he mm. knows he knows he just has to prove it right and once he proves it it's like how do i stop this <laughs> this guy <Exactly>. right <laughs> he just can't be like you did it i know you did it now you know I, I ain't gonna put cuffs on him so uh it's gonna be very interesting to see how this develops uh but i am really liking this show very much how many episodes is this gonna be i think it's eight I think we're halfway there. I hope they don't take too long in getting the next uh, season up for for this show because it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna be missed after is that first mm -hmm. season is over. Oh, so let us if you haven't watched it, we suggest that you watch it. If we suggest something, it's because it's dope. If you make it to the end of episode one, you'll watch. Of course. The rest. Like I'm just gonna say, like if you're in episode one and kind of not sure midway through, <laughs> trust us. Get to the end Watch of the episode, yes. you will continue watching. Exactly, exactly. Let us know what you think in the comment section below. Below, before for the people that did watch it. Um, next up, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Now we're three episodes in, correct? Halfway there. Yeah. Yeah, three more to go. Uh, I have to say, man, Marvel doesn't disappoint. It's like, there are a few things that sort of like, you're like, okay, what happened there? But whatever, I, I, I think I'll mention it. You tell me what you thought of this because it didn't make sense to me. But listen, from the get, the action sequence with Falcon, was amazing to watch. It got you back in the Marvel mode, which you're sort of used to seeing, but from a diff different perspective, from Falcon's perspective and what his abilities are and what he can do. And this whole new situation after the blip, right? And the I'm, I'm most intrigued with Bucky's storyline. Right. And how he I think I think this scene summed it up for me was um, and I think it was in episode two where he's sitting down with uh, Sam and, and in front of the therapist. Right. He said, if he was wrong about you, he must have been wrong about me. So he's struggling with trying to not have a bad day. Right. In terms of Bucky, you know, Bucky, uh, Cap believes in Bucky and, and him being a, a good person and all this other stuff. Yet he has this past which which is causing him nightmares and he didn't do such good things. And people know him for not doing very good things. So that rep is always going to be there with him. And all it takes is a situation to drive him to that point that who knows if that although Shuri got the programming out of him, that ability or that um, situation that puts him in a, in a, in a, in a, because everybody has it, puts him in that mode where he's going to snap and he's going to go off. He's scared to turn into that person again. So that is a very intriguing storyline that I, and, and another one, and I got to mention it, that Isaiah Bradley, when he showed up on screen and that is not his first foray in the superhero world not even close many years ago he did i think it was two season on fox he was yep. uh, the lead in the mantis i saw that show it was horrible but i you know i watched it 
And man, did he, you believe when he said, get out. Well, he also no. is, he's also a let, a guarantee if you follow this genre, you know his voice, even if you don't know him, because he is John Jones from the Justice League animated series. Wow, I didn't know that. He's Mars Man. He's been wow. that, he was that for years. He's a, wow. Our alumni. Yeah, my, I, yes, yes, yes. I, I'm surprised I didn't put two and two together. If I would have probably listened to a, a, a Justice League show and heard that voice, I would have been like, oh, snap, that's this dude. Um, but yeah, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts so far? You, one thing I have to say that bothered me, and you know how I pick out these things, you'd be like, yeah, the, <laughs> that, that's sort of weird was when they sneaked on they sneaked on to that truck there was a truck behind and he snuck into the second one so i'm saying to myself how the hell they didn't react because it's not like the driver behind them didn't see what was happening when bucky went into that it's like what is you know that didn't make sense to me but that's one of those things but tell me what you think so far Wow, I got a lot of thoughts. So try to keep this as tight as I can. So the mm -hmm. first thing is I think I've adapted my thinking a little bit post WandaVision. So I'm actually really glad we're discussing this show after episodes two and three, because I think once again, episode one is a little bit different. I think two and three really blow this up into a whole other dimension of storytelling that mm -hmm. we would not have been able to discuss. Mm -hmm. So that's number one is I'm, I'm definitely looking at these shows and saying, I think it's better to have a few episodes strung together where we can get a sense of where they might be going. I think the second thing is I'm less focused and hung up on the Easter eggs of which there are many, because I think when I think about what Marvel did with WandaVision, they did ultimately really want the focus to be on the few central characters. They created all the strands, but you know, this idea that they were going to introduce this and introduce that, like they will on their terms. Yeah. So I look at a lot of what's going on in this show and we'll hopefully talk a little bit more about it, you know, whether it's tonight or in future shows as world building. I think this is the equivalent of if you ever played you know, Elder Scrolls or Baldur's Gate or any famous RPG, it's like you can play the single player game and you can beat it. But there's this whole other civilization around it that if you were to keep exploring kind of goes off in all these directions. So there is mutant fingerprints all over this show. I do not think you're going to see Wolverine or anybody like that in the show. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But the fact that Madripoor exists now, the fact that the Princess Bar exists now, the fact that you're seeing this idea of the government creating more superheroes which is something that was only really referenced in incredible hulk and back in captain america the first avenger mm -hmm. now we're discovering that this may have gone to a more sinister level which is one step away from it's not quite mutation but it's sort of like mutation so you're opening up all these channels which i don't think are going to pay off in these next three episodes but i do feel like when we get there in the films and in the other shows it's going to feel like Marvel doesn't have to take all the time to explain to you what matter for you is. Yeah. Like it's already been on the map for however many years. So they're kind of buying themselves time in future films and future shows, which is incredibly smart because normally yeah, it course. takes a lot of time to build that. So that's my number two theme is like, I see so much of that in this show. Of like they're just creating a civilization, yeah, just yeah. file the name away. It's not yeah. going to matter in this show, yeah, yeah, but it yeah, will yeah. matter somewhere down the road. And you're going to so remember I really love that. Yeah. I think in terms of the show itself, there is a line from Winter Soldier, which has always been one of my favorites in the MCU, which I think is really being carried forward into the show. And it's when Nick Fury and Cap are going down the elevator and he's going to show them Project Insight. And they're arguing kind of about the virtues of what they're doing, which is, you know, Cap is very sort of pro-freedom and Nick Fury is kind of cynical, right? Like I've seen all this go bad. We need this stuff. And he says, S.H.I.E.L.D. takes the world as it is, not how we'd like it to be. And I think this that's the DNA of this show because they're trying to create this arc of Sam Wilson becoming Captain America. 
And the reality is you can't do that unless you deal with issues like race, unless you deal with politics to some extent. And that is a dangerous thing, quite honestly, in entertainment. I think mm -hmm. you always run the risk of if you go turn the volume up on that too much, there's a piece of the viewing audience that's going to say, I didn't come here for to be beaten over the head with politics. I came here to be entertained. Yeah, yeah. But Marvel so far doing a very good job of leaning on the comics. So like Isaiah Bradley is not a made up character. He's yeah. from the comics. So, the idea so. of the racial tension of the original potential black Captain America, who's then imprisoned for effectively taking up Steve Rogers mantle when he wasn't available for a mission. That's basically what happened to the comics. Yeah, yeah. That is canon. So they're bringing that into a modern lens with Sam's own struggle of he's not ready yeah. to wear the shield for a variety of reasons, but dancing around that in this show as we see when he's almost arrested, which is clearly a racially motivated incident, yeah. and he's not let go for virtuous reasons. He's let go because he's a he's celebrity not, and yeah, recognized yeah, exactly. as an Avenger, not because of the color of his skin. So yeah, yeah. I think Marvel so far, knock on wood, doing a very good job of balancing the entertainment with these core issues yeah. that you have to use to move the story forward. I'd be curious as to your reaction as to like, did you feel it was too much? Do you feel like it's just right? Do you feel like it needs to be more? Because it has been present and it's been growing in each episode, but it hasn't overwhelmed the, the tone of each episode yet. So I'm curious as to your thoughts on that theme. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, um, I like, they're picking their spots. They're not overly putting it in your face because we knew there was going to be this sort of situation with him being, you know, Captain America and him being black and, you know, the stuff in the bank that happened in the bank, you know, it's little moments that you see these things. It's not, you know, the Isaiah Bradley was a big one, was certainly a big one. Right. And then immediately what happened to happen afterwards was another instance of that. And we haven't seen that after. Um, I like the balance that they're taking with a lot of the real worst, real world stuff that we're dealing with. Um, but it's interesting to me and the way they're going about introducing certain things that are definitely going to come up in the future. Like that Princess Bar thing was, they, they're giving you, like here, Princess Bar, for those of you who know, this is what it is. They're not going to open the door. They can't open that door yet. No. Because if they do, then the expectation is going to be too great. And, you know, people may be disappointed that they're not seeing enough of it. But they're giving you little things so that you can know. And later on, we can probably revisit. You can see finally Wolverine walking into this bar. It'll be more um, exciting to see those things. Um, but so far I like, uh, the way Captain America is, everybody hates Captain America, this version of Captain America. Yeah. And that's the way they want it. <laughs> so I actually think they haven't promoted this and talked about it, but I do think there's another theme here, which is topical that they are touching on with Bucky and with, um, us agent, uh, which is, this is effectively superhero PTSD on display. That's kind of how I interpret it. You, on the one hand, you have this guy who has no powers. But he really doesn't. I think he, that, I think he, uh, you're talking about has no powers in the, the current uh, Captain not America. Yet. Not yet. I think he, I think clearly he's, he's going to go for one of the serum syringes. He's going to want one of those 20 vials, right? To supercharge him up. But my point is he's a three-time Medal of Honor winner. His physical skills, even if they're human, are off the charts. And yet he is clearly incredibly volatile, incredibly dangerous. He curses, which is definitely a nod to Cap saying language from Age of Ultron. Like he is everything Steve Rogers is not as a human being, but it's not that he's pure evil. Because you do see these moments where he flashes I'm just trying to get the, he's just trying to get the mission done, but his way of doing it is not a hero's way. 
Yeah, yeah. So I think you see him struggling with that role and that burden of he's got to be this family friendly face to the world. And underneath, he's this sort of hardened soldier who quite honestly is one step on the wrong side of the line. Yeah. And then they put that alongside Bucky, who we have come to root for, despite you know 70 years of him doing awful things, which he is trying to grapple with as he goes on a date, as he talks to people in society. So you're kind of seeing these two parallel paths, I feel like, of one guy who's starting to break bad as mm -hmm. Captain America, and another guy who's trying to figure it out, but he's one trigger away from going nuts on the wrong <laughs> innocent at the wrong time. Yeah. They're not all that different. They're yeah. not all that different. We're just conditioned to root for the one and root against the other. Uh, and so I think Marvel's doing a really nice job of taking us behind the curtain on that because it's just something you can't do in a film. You, you can nod to it, but you can't spend time on it. Mm -hmm. And we're spending time on it, especially in episodes two and three. So, you know, I think that's that's commendable that you're kind of getting getting that angle from both. And then on top of that, I'll throw it back to you. I mean, now I know why Daniel Brühl signed to come back because they were like, you can just chew on all your seat. You can just ham up all your scenes you can dance you can play with these guys you can talk about marvin gay like yeah. <laughs> i just looked at this i was like he must have demanded like if i'm gonna be this part again i'm gonna wear this mask for you you have to let me like have fun fun yeah this. yeah yeah definitely he, he is does. yeah yeah definitely he's one of the um favorites of that last episode and i'm pretty sure people are looking forward to seeing him to seeing more of him in subsequent episodes and see what the double cross will be no doubt <laughs> uh but it, for for captain america it all started for me do you know who i am the classic yeah. do you know who i am talk is like oh god not this not this this whoever whoever says that you already know this like oh this guy's a jerk yeah so the, i mean marvel has a way of making you feel what you want to like, what they want you to feel towards a character. Yeah. They want you to hate them. You'll probably hate them. If they want you to be in awe of him, you'll, you, you, and be afraid of him, Thanos, you'll be afraid of him. If they want you to be like, this guy's up to something, but I like him. Baron's, you know, there's, you, either dislike or like a character, but because they want you to feel that way towards that character. And, and getting back to my point about taking the world as it is, the Captain America franchise, of which I include this, has been the best at living in those shades of gray. One of my yeah. favorite scenes in episode three is that couple of minutes we spend with Carly Morgenthau and the other kind of super powered, I don't know what to call them, flag master, flag yeah. smashers. Flag smashers. And yeah. you hear them go get in that conversation about, hey, I wanted to be a teacher. You know, they, and, they, and you hear this perspective of the classic, they are villains, but you kind of sympathize with what they're trying, trying to, do. to do, even if the methods are incredibly cruel and ruthless, as when she detonates the explosion and kills a bunch of innocents. But right before that, you're kind of listening to her talk about herself from an emotional standpoint, a personal standpoint. So right there, they're no longer these sort of masked, superpowered henchmen. They're characters. They have virtues, they have vices, and it's a little bit echoes of Killmonger, right? This idea of like, you know you're supposed yes. to root against him, but you kind of see uh, some of what he's saying, the exactly. validity of it. Exactly, exactly. And so they they do a great job in this ep in that last episode of really making you feel like, yeah, I know who I'm supposed to root for, but nobody is clean in this. Nobody's super clean and nobody's super dirty. Everyone yeah. kind of lives somewhere, you know, between the 20 yard lines. And I, and even Sharon Carter, who, you know, incredibly bad. I let her kick some Ooh. ass in the third episode. Ooh. But then the way she drives off, you're like, wait a minute, is she on the good guy's side yeah. or is she? Yeah, some she people been... are saying that he's, she's the power broker, but I think that's just too I'll easy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd be pretty surprised. I think, before we move on, I just want to make this comment. Um, the key to what Marvel has done is, 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 is helping us, the fans, 
and the people watching shows, movies, is understanding the motivations of each and every character. You understand where they're coming from and why they do what they do. And I think that's what's important in telling whatever story that they want to tell and it making sense. Oh, so last, that last one for me, last one for me. Uh-huh. Wakanda, what did you think about having oh, it brought snap. into this series in the way that it was? I, you know what? I was having a conversation with Freddie, Freddie Maloney from Brooklyn. What's up, Freddie? Um, I said to him as I was talking to him about that, 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 that uh, scene, the conversation is going to be interesting to listen to what she says because you got to understand this. Who sent you? I want to know who sent you. What is she going to say? Is she going to say the Black Panther sent me? Is she going to say the King sent me? Who is she going to say that sent her? I'm interested to see what that conversation is going to be like. To see if it reveals something about the future of uh, Ryan Coogler's uh, Black Panther 2, which he's writing. So that's what I'm most interested in in seeing because what kind of is not going to let that go right so you yeah yeah exactly um and 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 sam said it so it's like oh snap you think the wakandas are going to forget about this or they haven't forgot not only that but they they rehabbed winter soldier and he's the one who broke the guy out killed their king yeah 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 there's gonna be not yeah, a good look yeah yeah exactly exactly it's <laughs> gonna be a very interesting conversation to see what happens there so friday uh i'm going to uh i'm i, I don't know if i'm gonna wait too long to see it because i'm really looking forward to seeing what is said in that conversation this better have a second season though that's all i'm gonna say because with only three shows left there's so way too much story to be told yeah right they haven't yeah. said though. Yeah, yeah. Let us know what you uh, think in the comment section below. So f- about what you think so far about the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Uh, let us know in the comment section below. Black Widow trailer. They released another trailer. I'm gonna say it again, Brian. I'm gonna say it again. You thought I was crazy when I first said it, but I think. This movie is going to be on par with, in my opinion, to be on par with one of the best, now, if not the best Marvel film ever done, which is The Winter Soldier. Winter Soldier is number one in my book. Yeah, and I think Black Widow is going to be, it, it's going to be on that level of film when we get to see it uh june or july july 9th july 9th what did you think of that last trailer and taskmaster looks someone formidable and i'm interested in seeing all the fight scenes with him because those are going to be i guess the best parts of that film in terms of action sequences toxic yeah no i think i think that's right because i think Taskmaster obviously mirrors and learns and adapts and embodies all of the fight techniques basically of all the heroes we've seen. So you basically should recognize almost everything you see. But in some ways it should be kind of Marvel's answer to some of the fight scenes in Tenet which had that mirrored effect. And I think you're gonna see a little bit of that in this. Um, And then as we know, as we talked about in our Snyder Cut Oscars, ScarJo is always good for Yes four or five of these sort of <laughs> incredible sequences yeah, physically yeah. where you're just sort of watching her and saying, well, how did she do that? And so now you're going to be doing that presumably opposite someone who can do the same thing. So no, it looks great. I mean, I, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a little more reserved in my expectations. I don't have the bar quite that high, but I, look, I, mean, I think it's going to be incredibly enjoyable. I think Florence Pugh looks great as sort of the successor widow, if you will, to yeah. that character. The accent sounds good. She looks good. Um, obviously there's going to be a lot of strong female, you know, leads in this movie with them and, and Rachel Weisz. So no, I think we waited a long time to see this and, and, uh, and hopefully it'll sort of fill in, fill in the blanks nicely for, for Natasha's story. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. It's funny. Like I was fresh off, um, 
watching Sharon Carter do her thing in, in Falcon Winter Soldier. And I was like, we set up a tournament just between <laughs> sort of the the non superpowered yeah. kind of fighters that we've got on the board here for for Marvel. Who would actually who would actually be the number one seed and who would actually come through with a victory? I don't know. That's good. That would be pretty tough. You put like a Koye in there. You put put uh, <sighs> you know. Black Widow, Florence yeah. Pugh, you put Sharon yeah, Carter. I mean, tough it's, ones, man. it's a good list. It's a yeah. Good list. yeah, that's that's a tough one. I was gonna say Black Widow off the bat, but then you think of a Koye and 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 some of those other female um um uh, fighters. Yeah, it'll be tough. But um let us know what you think of Black Widow, the Black Widow trailer, the last trailer, uh, apparently. Um, and do you think this is gonna be on par with the Winter Soldier? And let me ask you this. How much money do you think it makes? You know, after seeing Godzilla versus Kong's box office and feeling like we're going to be all three months later into the reopening vaccination process, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this breaks 800 million for sure. Wow. That's a good number. That's a good number. That's a that's a Wonder Woman level number. That's what it kind of feels right. It's a standalone Wonder film. Woman one. Wonder Woman one. Yeah, it's a it's a standalone film with a character we know and have been and obviously have loved for a long time, and it's the final send off. I mean, maybe billion just feels a little high for the scale of this, but and we're not fully reopened, and we've got the premier option, but. 800, 800 million global box. That's what I'll go with. And that doesn't count the th anyone who pays the 30 bucks, obviously. We'll find yeah, out yeah. I think if no pandemic, definitely a billion. Definitely a billion if no pandemic. But your number seems pretty pretty good that I, I think it'll it'll probably do that. I, um, we'll see. We'll see. But it's definitely going to do well. Uh, people are, uh, you know... It's Marvel, man. I think any movie that Marvel puts up on the screen is an event. And uh, I think people are going to show off for it. Next up, the Loki trailer. Brian, you just got to see it. I just mm -hmm. saw it this uh, afternoon. And uh, I don't know where, I forget where this ranked when we were doing our ranks. Was this on the bottom half of our bottom this? half for me? I think I think you had it one spot higher than I did. Yeah, we weren't too far off in terms of where we had it listed. It was a good trailer. It's, it's, it was a good trailer. Um, we saw a lot of things in there that looked pretty uh, dope, and and some of the things that. Um, that when you think back to uh, the Sorcerer Supreme at the time, what was her name? The Ancient One. Ancient she one. was explaining her 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 um, thoughts on what would happen if one of the stones were taking taken away from its uh, place, that it would c create another one. And you saw sort of like a a, a actual thing showing what he yeah. had done and created and he has to help set all those things right so is definitely going to be now at first when we first saw this whole thing happening we didn't get a lot of context so i was unsure of how he was going to be able to do it now we understand that the tie variance authority is going to take him to all these different timelines for him to, to fix so all that stuff makes sense. Um, what were your thoughts on this Loki trailer? Are you excited? Are you more excited for this? Uh, what are your thoughts? I'd say a little more. It still would be in the bottom half for me. I think the piece that crystallized things and maybe confirmed our suspicions was, as you said, there's a scene that literally shows these timelines diverging. And then there's a quick cut montage of familiar places we see sort of the throne in Asgard. We see places we've been before yeah. and Loki kind of shooting in and out of those. So I think it sort of is a, 
kind of like a quantum leap meets the spy genre where it's like Loki's the spy and Owen Wilson's his handler sending him out into the field. And then there's a little bit of that comic nice. sprinkling between those two. That's what it looked and felt like to me, which is not a bad thing. Man. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, me too. Show. But uh, my only, my struggles are still, it's Owen Wilson being Owen Wilson and I'm not totally sold that's going to be great for this role. Mm -hmm. And then there's an awful lot of Tom Hiddleston kind of giving you the look at me. And I, this trailer was light on the supporting cast beyond those two. And so I do think this show is going to need others yeah, and reliable others around those two to really make this work. So, you know, count me and still it'd be in the lower echelon, but, you know, obviously I'll watch it and, um, and I know Tom Hiddleston will be good. I know Owen Wilson will be good. He's just Owen Wilson. So, you know, we'll see where it goes. But seeing the familiar locations and the diverging timelines, given what I just said about, you know, Winter Soldier and WandaVision, my biggest curiosity is what kind of world building are we going to get through this? Because that could really be the key with the TVA formally being introduced, because we know that's going to matter a lot. Oh, hell yeah. We're definitely going to get Easter eggs for uh, Kang the Conqueror, most likely. How they'll do that is a point of interest for me. Um, and what it, obviously, the world building aspect of it is going to be very interesting because, you know, with each show, that's what you get. You get this like, expansion of new stuff and possible stuff and it's, it's just a joy to see man it just you know i think marvel is artful enough that if you never subscribe to disney plus you will still be immensely entertained by all the films yeah but if you do subscribe i just it just has this already this feeling of you're going to have such a rich text to yes. all of the product and, and, and that's the whole point and that's the whole point. Let us know what you thought of the Loki trailer. Um, and let us know if you have a ranking of all the shows, where does this list yeah. on your uh, on your ranking? Uh, speaking of universe expansion and, and Easter eggs and Easter eggs and all the good things that Marvel brings. Let's go in the opposite direction now. Martian Manhunter and Green Lantern was supposed to make originally Zack Snyder. His original plan was to have him show up at Bruce Wayne's doorstep, as you saw in the Zack Snyder cut with Martian Manhunter showing up. Listen, I really don't like talking about this because it gets me upset, <laughs> but had I seen that scene that he was talking about, I would have gotten like, you know how people get up from the, the theaters and just walk out. I would have gotten up out of my living room and just walked out. That would have been for me a horrible scene because then you have to ask the question again where the hell were you guys now you want to help where were you that needs an explanation I get the Green Lantern he's probably on some other mm. but it's like I need that explanation especially for Martian Manhunter Martian Manhunter forget about it that needs an explanation I, I I just don't buy it. I think it's just a person just thinking that it was cool to do that. Listen, there's a lot of cool things you can do, but does it make sense? You can do a lot of cool stuff, but does it make sense? Does it bring any... I don't just want to see a, ca a superhero character, a character on film. I just don't want to see it just to see it. I want to see it if it makes sense. 
if it adds to the story that didn't that wouldn't have added anything but just the oohs and ahs and that's about it what are your thoughts on that possible of that if that would have happened what would your reaction would have been to see that so the quotes that have come out after this have really this whole little scene has taken on a life of its own so it sounds like best we can piece together the original design was for John Stewart Green Lantern to be what Martian Manhunter was in that scene, visiting Bruce Wayne. Now, to your point, the dialogue does make more sense if it's Green Lantern. It, he, it is more justifiable that he would have been off world, that he would have been in another galaxy and unable to help yeah. in the last couple of years. So I kind of get the the lines more when you tell me you really wanted this to be John Stewart. Where it gets a little bit confusing is then there's an account that says there's a version of this scene where they're both in the scene, that they're there together. Okay, weird. Does that mean they have a history that may be off world? I, so that's also weird. And also, like I said, Zach shot the scene. So there is a, there's somewhere out there that he has it, I'm sure. There's a scene of an actor who was cast as Jon Stewart shot in the role who was intended to be used as the role down the road. And we never will find out, I guess. Maybe we will someday. <laughs> that is. So then there's a quote where, the, so the studio nixes Jon Stewart because they have plans for it. And the quote is, Martian Manhunter becomes the compromise. Part of the reason for the compromise is it sounds like one of the conditions was it needed to be a person of color in that scene, which kind of adds a little strange wrinkle to all of this as to, so no issues with that piece of it, but just odd that, I, that there's a, I need to shoot this stinger scene effectively at the end and it has to be a certain ethnicity to the characters in the scene to I, I think when i first watched it i kind of was like this whole scene is superfluous we don't mm. really need it the movie's ended a couple of times already i think you're good <laughs> like i don't i don't require this mm. and then the, when we heard all these subplots behind this 30 seconds of footage or whatever it was it just was like was it really worth was it all worth it like was it worth it to get that in there the way it was and quite honestly you kind of gave Green Lantern's lines to Martian Manhunter, which is fueling kind of our confusion a lot in terms of why we're like, this is not acceptable. Yeah, it's like, yeah. we, don't, we don't buy this. Yeah, yeah. So you're kind of left with this sense of better to have not done it at all than to have done it half measure, which is kind of what it feels like we got. And I think that's unfortunate. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really change my overall experience yeah. with the movie, but it's just, like I said, it's just strange that this has become such a big deal and it just focuses my attention on, we didn't have to have it with four yeah. hours and two minutes, we were okay. Yeah. As you said in a previous, uh, I think it was either in the Aftermath or the Aftermath show that we put out a couple of days ago at, or the first uh, show after the release of Snyder Cut, where you said that this was Zach's opportunity or Zach wanted to just lay out all his cards and, and just yeah. do everything. I get it, but I think it's just, it's just confusing. And, and I hate when I listen to people say, oh, and when Zach says, oh, this would have been cool, it's like, this would have been cool. Okay, what what, what about it? You know, it's, it has to be more than it, this would have been cool. I don't care about things being cool. I think I care about things making sense. And then moving on from that into something else. It's just, listen, this whole release of Snyderverse is is. Is, is, is weak to me because after that is over and yet still Justice League is still a polarizing thing that I think everybody should enjoy the same way people enjoy Infinity War and Endgame whoever says Infinity War and Endgame was whack I don't know what to tell you my friend 
Justice League for me, it should have been so much better. And obviously, we all agreed that this version of what Zach put out is better than what was released. But still, it wasn't like, oh my God, this was the best thing. No, it, it wasn't. So, so let me let me roll this by you because ever since we've been having an, um, a fair amount of jokes at the expense of Martian Manhunter here in terms of <laughs> what you've been doing, I actually went back to the existing material and I said, could you, could I make this work? So here's what I came up with. See if you buy this. Mm -hmm. So you remember the scene at the end of Man of Steel where Superman knocks the satellite out of the sky in front of Lennox? Mm -hmm. But what if in that scene, you wipe out the other characters and Lennox reveals himself as Martian Manhunter there? And he basically tells him, look, well, is. Yeah. this is all a cover story. This is all cover. But I'm watching. Like, so he would have missed the Zod battle. He still would have ordered the choppers to fire on Clark. So it's not perfect. But if he reveals himself at the end of Man of Steel, so you know he's present in that role, and it alerts Clark to, you have this maybe ally, but other super-powered alien on the planet. Yeah. I thought that actually was, of the existing scenes that have been shot, was the most natural place to put it. Now, I can get you a bailout of the Doomsday fight, which is they cased that entire coast in fire. So he'd have been useless in that fight. And he did help Lois give her intel throughout the movie. So you could have then watched that knowing he's passing her intel. Maybe you could have shape-shifted him here and there. But you basically could have said, like, he can't help in the final conflict because it's too much fire and he's useless. Yeah. So I was my, that was my short way of bailing him out and basically saying if we put him throughout the trilogy, it might have given you an avenue to put him in Justice League in a way that didn't feel as forced because then you could have him shapeshift into one of the action scenes or maybe even the final battle. And you might actually think it was cool because you're yeah. like, okay, he's kind of been at the periphery and yeah. now he's able to engage in the yeah. final battle. I don't know. I was trying to come up with it a was, way to try to make this That work. moment right there was just a missed opportunity. Yeah. It was, it was just Zach just wanting to do cool stuff and not really think about story. I mean, it could have been the perfect opportunity to introduce the Martian Manhunter. We could have seen the Martian Manhunter use his tele telepathy to co communicate and bring the Justice League together. Yep. Instead of having Batman be the guy whom we know never wanting to be a part of any team. He's always hesitant about it, but he does it because he realizes he never brings the, the Justice League together. He's a part-timer. <laughs> if you remember that quote, yeah, he says it over and over again. And they made him the guy. And it's like, again, I have yet to have a conversation with anybody telling me how dope this movie was. I'm waiting. Um, Next up. Oh, wait, can we talk about the other his piece of history? Ah, I got to talk about this. Go ahead. So there's a story that came out that Zack Snyder approached for the role of Zod, one Daniel Day-Lewis. Okay, so <laughs> Daniel Day-Lewis, winner of three Oscars, I believe he's the only actor to win three lead Oscars in a leading role. So this is a guy who, when he was in My Left Foot, insisted that people on the set carry him around in a wheelchair the entire production. This is a guy who, on Last of the Mohicans, went and lived in the wilderness, actually hunted animals, carried a rifle around the entire production. Wow. Oh my God. I would pay anything <laughs> to see his method acting of generals. Would this guy have literally gone into space learn how to fly. <laughs> if anyone could have learned to actually shoot rays of light out of his eyes, it would have would been, have been him, Lewis, yeah. and I would have just wanted to see him try so badly. And not only that, what I also thought was funny was there's a scene right before Michael Shannon gets sent to the Phantom Zone where he says, I will find him, which is basically just like, I will find you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he almost got it in there. I saw that story and I was just amused that they went to him and actually had a conversation and i will say this like i said you know 
shouts to Zack Snyder because you have no fear. If you're gonna nah. shoot your shot with that guy to play General Zod in a Superman yeah, movie, yeah, he, ha he has. He Zach, Zach has power no fear. to you. Zach has no fear. <laughs> if he wants to somebody to play, he's gonna go and ask. I wonder what that conversation was like. I would pay anything just to have heard the exchange between the two. I want to hear speaking. what Daniel Day Lewis. Oh said my to goodness. Him. What a story. That was amazing. <laughs> I hope if he ever does an interview, they ask him about that. What did you tell him? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that, yeah, that's, that's a great story right there. That hopefully it comes out one day. Danny Day Lewis is doing an interview and they ask him about that. Um, the trench and the new God movie whom, which I said, the new guys movie I said was never going to come out. Despite whatever, whatever WB is saying as to the reasoning behind it all. For me, the reason is behind the Zack Snyder situation. Ava DuVernay is not going to compete and do a movie where everybody's asking for this version when she's trying to do this. Whether to, to me, it just never made sense for her to want to do this film. And that's why that film is not getting done. I don't care what WB is saying. That's all, that's all spinning right there. And the trench gets canceled. Who, first of all, who wanted the trench? Like really who, who, who said, oh, this would be dope. Who said that, that was one of the strangest pieces of news when it came out. The only thing I thought of at the time was it was a thank you to James Wan for delivering them their first sort of billion dollar plus picture. And they were just like, you're, you know, great. Whatever you want to do, we'll write you a check. Yeah. But I'm with you. I mean, I didn't even find the trench sequence in Aquaman all that unforgettable. It was kind of like, okay, it's fine. It's like, it was instantly out of my mind. The movie was over. Yeah. Listen, horror films, this is supposed to be a horror film. Yeah. And James Wan is a great horror director, I will say that. But. I don't know what kind of budget they use for horror films, but I'm pretty sure this one would have been above whatever yes. that budget would have been. Yeah. And it's like, but my thing is like, who said this was going to be dope? Who said, yo, they're doing the trip? Who, if somebody would have told me like, yo, they're doing the trench movie, yo, I can't, like, what? You can't wait for what? The trench? Hell no. It does it doesn't. I don't know what WB is doing over there. But I guess, you know, they're course correcting right now. They they're trying. This doesn't fit into their plans. So the WB has a plan now. And like we've always said, this plan starts with Flashpoint. What happens if this movie gets done, which is supposed to start shooting. Hopefully they replace Ezra Miller. If this movie gets done, the new direction for DC is going to be after Flashpoint. That's why the trench didn't make sense beyond other reasons that it just didn't make sense to you to do. And the new guns because of all the BTS stuff going on. Yeah, I, I think if I had to guess... I would say the trench was a rethink of how, to your point, what the audience and the mass market appeal of this answer was going to be. I think New Guys was probably more of a creative differences call because Ava DuVernay had worked on that legitimately for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think she, you know, when you saw that, they, they were diplomatic in the public statements they put out. But she's also not the kind of filmmaker who's just going to play ball to play ball. Yeah, so yeah, my yeah. guess is they got to a point where the, she was like, well, this is what I want to do with these characters. And the studio was probably, no, that's not really what we have in mind thematically for the, the universe and the multiverse that we're building. And it's and she's, you know, she's the kind of filmmaker who's basically going to be like, okay, I'm out. that's it. <laughs> yeah, there's really not really, that's an impasse. And I'm, I'm okay with that, but... Yeah, you know, yeah. We're not, we're not. So I think that one was kind of mutual, probably when we when we yeah. got down to it. So. Yeah, I just would have been. It, it would have been dope to see Orion and how. Sure. I, 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 visually, I was interested in seeing what this was going to look like. Right. Um, 
but beyond that, what would it have, what would it have been? That's, you know, my question. Because right now is like, okay, you give me this film. I want to see what this leads towards. What is this building? What's next? You know, I'm, I'm in that zone right now with, with superhero films, with certain superhero stuff. You know, right? because the Batman, I think Matt Reeves is probably supposed to be just a trilogy. I'm fine with Batman stories. You can give me Batman stories all day. It doesn't have to be connected to anything. I'm cool with it. As long as it's dope. As long as you give me Batman, and which is what we're going to get. And that's what I believe still Batman is going to break Black Panther's record. Anyway, let's continue. Um... This is a conversation and this is our final topic. And this is a conversation that I just, that I wanted to have with Brian because he made a couple of statements, statements uh, during the week regarding the possibility of, cause there's some rumors out there that, you know, the rock really wants to make this a uh, hell of a film in the box office rather, you know, that he wants to get this to a billion dollars. I don't doubt that because I'm pretty sure when he saw Jason Momoa, he got a billion dollars out the gate. He probably looked at his like film catalog, no billion dollars and none of all, and all these joints that I've done, probably not even close except for Fast and the Furious stuff that he's not the, 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 the number one guy. This ain't about you. For Jason Momoa, it was about Aquaman. It was about him. He made a billion dollars and out the gate. The Rock said, "I no, this cannot happen. I got to get me a billion dollar film. But we had discussed that this is not possible or, uh, or an unlikely possibility because The Rock is not a billion dollar man. And there were several reasons why, and I'm gonna let Brian break it down for you. And 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 most likely, you know, I, I will agree with his assessment, but I still think otherwise. Go ahead, Brian. So I will gladly and very happily eat crow on this if I'm wrong. <laughs> I think this is a, so. I, I will say I, I believe there's a zero percent chance this. Wow, movie. zero, zero. Wow. Okay. And here are the reasons why. So first off, we toss around a billion dollars like it's easy. Yeah. It's not. No. It's not. It's been done 15 times, I believe. Uh, it was, sorry, within, I think, the superhero genre. But okay. 11 of the 15, if I recall, are of sequels, right? They're Avengers movies, they're the culmination movies, or, you know, the movie's already been, the character's already been made famous several times over before you get that. So, you know, a good example, Batman Begins is about 400, 500 million. Dark Knight blows it up. Heath Ledger dies, wins an Oscar. Now you're at a billion one, billion two, Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. So, point being, an origin film, a, a first out of the gate intro to a character almost never gets a billion dollars, almost never. So if we look at even films that would qualify as quasi origin, what you find is the character has typically been in another movie. So you mentioned Aquaman, Jason Momoa was in Justice League. He is introduced in another film and then you see Aquaman. Mm -hmm. Black Panther, $1.3 billion. Black Panther has a, a leading supporting role, let's call it that, in Civil War. So you already have the Wakanda world being brought to you before you get the launch of the individual character. Mm -hmm. Captain Marvel is probably technically the closest. The only reason I might asterisk that is because of the proximity to Endgame. This was sort of the bridge to the final movie of the 22 i think they got a pass on kind of a average film but i kind of think they could have probably put anything out at that slot and gotten around a billion dollars but yeah. technically captain marvel qualifies mm -hmm. and the other one is joker which you can debate whether joker is really an origin or not but 
it's an original standalone film with a different take on the character that goes right to a billion dollars. So that's your list. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that Black Adam is going to be in that list. It's basically Joker and then sort of the three asterisks. Mm -hmm. With never having seen the character before on screen in any capacity, which we won't. The second piece of the issue, which you've alluded to, is The Rock as a box office draw. The Rock has billion dollar films on his resume, but he has billion dollar films on his resume kind of the way Sam Jackson has billion dollar films on his <laughs> resume. He is not, he's not the sun. He's not the center of the universe in those films. So if you look at the top eight grossing movies of his career, they all have something in common, which is they're Fast and Furious franchise movies of which he only joined Fast Enough and then spun off into Hobbs and Shaw. Jumanji, which as we mentioned, was a blockbuster film with Robin Williams in the 90s that was rebooted for The Rock in 2017. Mm -hmm. And Moana, which of course hits his voice in, in, a, in an animated film. His most lucrative solo effort, which this is not a totally solo effort, but he is far and away the headliner of this movie, Black Adam, has been $450 million of global box. So you are telling me he's going to more than double that in this film and also in the intro film to a comic book character that quite honestly is not frontline, is not in the top 10 probably of the DC, maybe not even the top 15. Mm -hmm. I, I would bet against it heavily. And I hope I'm wrong, but I also feel like the other thing that's working against him here is he doesn't have the A-list filmmaker alongside to push this. Mm -hmm. So if you have Chris Nolan, if you have Jim Cameron, you know, if you have Steven Spielberg, that can draw, that will get you the billion dollars out of the gate. Mm -hmm. But he has a director that he's worked with on some of his other films and they're always moder moderately successful. They're always moder They're always pretty entertaining. But it's, as I've always said, it's the B minus the B plus. That's the grade of the director. This is not an elite of the elite director that he's working with. So it is 100% on him pretty much to make this critically acclaimed, crowd pleasing, and globally marketable. Yeah. I think it's an incredibly tall order for anyone. I think I will be shocked if this <laughs> is a billion dollars worth. Shocked. You bring up a lot of good points, and it's hard to disagree with those points. But I have to say that. This film has been in the making for quite some time. It has a fan base that is waiting for this film to come out. And, you know, like I, I had never seen anyone take out a whole ad on all the billboards on Times Square. It's like, this dude is gonna do whatever it takes, marketing wise to get people to go see this. I don't doubt the trailer is going to be dope. I don't doubt that his character is going to be, in a way, awesome. In its visuals, when we first see it, uh, I think it's going to get a fan base who, fan, uh, listen, you know that the, the Rock has a fan base. We already sure. know this. He's added a bunch of other characters that we've never seen before. Hawkman, Adam Smasher, Dr. Fade, all these other characters that we've never seen on screen before. You know, and probably won't get that much, much character development in the screen, in, on, on screen, on, in this film. But the spectacle 
spectacle of it of it is going to be big enough that I think people and if it's a if it's a decent film that first weekend is going to be crucial and the reviews are going to be a second part to that they'll be crucial it has to be decent if it's crushed which it may be then the possibility of it making a billion dollars is not going to be there but if it's decent and you have the trailers the hype inflation <laughs> yeah but i mean i think it'll probably get there i think it'll probably get there i mean batman versus superman did 166 million opening weekend 820 was the final tally mm -hmm. critically not reviewed well cinema score not great but with batman and superman in the same agree movie with for you. the first time and they couldn't I get mean, to a billion dollars I, 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 I hear you there. i hear you i hear you i hear you i hear Part of the reason why aquaman did like i said apart from the fact that the character had been introduced is that again you had a filmmaker who had an international pull granted in another genre so james wan the film didn't get to a billion because of the US. It was fine. It was like 300 or whatever, but it got there because of international markets, it got there because of Asia, because this movie, the look of it, the way it played overseas just resonated with people because it looked kind of goofy. It, just, it looked <laughs> different. They, they, they found this weird lane of 80s kind of callback mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. worked for the global audience. I don't even know if they would have been expecting the box office they got, but that was kind of like lightning in a bottle. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, I'm skeptical The Rock is going to give you a tone and a look where you're like, whoa, this is something I haven't seen before. Yeah. I think you're going to get a lot of, you know, if you put a cape on Hobbs and let it, I mean, Hobbs basically is a superhero and Hobbs is Jean. You tell me he's not. He's like running down the side of a building with no, basically he is Black Adam. He's just not wearing the cape. Yet. Yeah, yeah. So I just, and he doesn't have the foil. You know, Pierce Brosnan is the biggest name actor besides him, but it's on his side in a supporting role. Like, he doesn't have that big name A-list foil that really gets you to sit up and say, well, what's that actor or actress going to do to balance him out? I, I, look, oh, I, hear you. I, I, I think I'm coming off as sort of very anti-rock, and I'm not. Like, I, oh, like, no, 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 no. He's no, a wrestler. No. I'm a huge fan of his as an entertainer. And I have the utmost respect for his talent. I just think when I see stuff saying like he's intent on making this a billion dollars plus, I'm like, and great, I'm all supportive of having dreams, but <laughs> I just don't want to point out to people how difficult what that really means in the context of the history of this industry. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And, and you, you bring up a lot of great points and, and it's difficult to argue against that, but I'm just looking at the hype building up uh, around it, people who have been waiting for this film, all the different characters that are going to be there. The only thing that he has to do really is put out a decent movie, not a great movie. Put out a decent movie. If it's decent, then it has a possibility of getting there. If it's whack that first weekend, if it's whack, if it gets torched in reviews, because he's been torched in movies with reviews, with bad reviews. If he can get past that and give us a decent film that people will have fun watching, I think he can get there. And, and plus, I'm telling you, he's going to put out all the stops for advertising and marketing for this film. It'll probably cost them a, a billion dollars. That's, that's not going to be a good trade for the studio. Break that, even. That. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, again, all the factors that you bring up as to why he he may not be bringing in a billion dollars at the box office is, is valid. Um, I think there's just a slight chance that he can do it 
because of all the things that I had just mentioned. So we'll see. Let us know what you think in the comment section below if you think The Rock is going to make a billion dollars on this film. I think he might be able to do it. I don't say, I'm not saying, I'm not going to sit here and say he will. I think he has a chance. Brian says zero, zero, zero. percent percent zero. chance. I say he has a slight chance, 25% chance of getting there. <laughs> Um, that is our show for today. Yes, a lot to discuss. Brian, any last words? No, other than it was really cool to just read stories about people going back to the theaters and it got me excited about hopefully, you know, seeing a light at the end of that tunnel and you know, us maybe being able to see a movie together again at some point. And you yeah, know, man. that's you know, it's been a long bit of been a long time. So yeah, no, I think that was the big, biggest thing for me was was, was that. And, uh, um, man, we still got our, our shows going, but uh, Mortal Kombat in a couple of weeks. I'm already starting to yeah, yeah. hold me on that. Yeah, Mortal Kombat <laughs> coming up, man. That's going to be, people are going to be excited to see that, man. I wonder what the numbers for that is going to be uh, when, it, when it finally comes out. But yeah, that's our show for today. Remember to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, share with your friends. It really does help support the channel. And we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gen Report.